Okay, so it's on the hour and uh, we'll begin uh, this webinar. So first of all, I'd like to, oh, just a sec here. I'm just admitting some people here. Okay, so it's on the hour and we will begin the webinar. Uh, good morning all, thank you all for joining us today for the second uh, webinar of our series. Um, we have some brief housekeeping before we begin. Oh, just wait, sorry. Thank you to the sponsors of the summit and webinar series. And you'll see their, their logos up on the screen. I'd also like to do some brief housekeeping for this Zoom session. So for example, during the presentations, all lines will be muted automatically. All videos will be kept off. During Q&A, you can mute and unmute yourself. This session is also being recorded in English and French. If you would like to access the French interpretation, click the world icon at the bottom of your screen, click mute original audio, and then select French. To submit a question, click chat at the bottom of the screen, type your question and press enter. Any technical difficulties, contact Axon Technical Support via the chat function. Okay, so uh, we do have, uh, this is our pre-summit webinar series, uh, Haudenosaunee Foods as Medicine. And our speaker today is, is uh, Dea Wedro Morrow, and she will be starting in a few minutes. Um, I would like to say a few words about, about uh, Dea Wedro. Sigeno Dea Wedro Morrow, the Haudenosaunee Cayuga Wolf is from the Haudenosaunee Cayuga Wolf Clan from the Six Nations of the Grand River in Ontario. She's a registered dietitian working with the land and water in her home community and is, of the, and is the chair of the Indigenous Nutrition Information and Knowledge Network in KIN of the Dietitians of Canada. Dea Wedro has been involved in health and social research development since 2010 with Western University, Northern Ontario School of Medicine, and the University of Ottawa and Montreal. She spe specializes in Haudenosaunee foods and water protection, as well as food sovereignty. So we would like to encourage people to use uh, social media to share what inspires them. Um, and also uh, the dates for the, uh, uh, the information is on how you can share that information. So the dates and registration for the, uh, for the following uh, upcoming pre-summit webinars is on the screen. We have a webinar on um, October 12th, and that's value-based healthcare from concepts to impact on the resilient healthcare systems and beyond. And also on November 2nd, jurisdictional rules in Canadian healthcare and determinants of health systems, systemic inequities in Canada. So we can look forward to, to seeing you there again. Okay, uh, there's an evaluation. Um, we would like to remind you to uh, get an email, well, when you get an email from us um, with the evaluation link shortly after webinar, we would appreciate that um, you fill that out for us. Tell us what you liked and um, other information and we would, that would be very much appreciated. Okay, so I would like to turn it over now to, um, to Dea Widro, who will begin her session. Okay. Yeah, well, Siano, everyone. Thank you for that, Sharon. It's been such a lovely experience sharing uh, all the work we've put together for the summit. And thank you for having me and having me uh, contribute a very small portion, um, but I'm grateful. I'll introduce myself. Dayo we don't ni walk Sanade, Motahioni, ni walk shout then, Gai Kono ni not ni walk Wednesday. My name is Terry Morrow. I'm from Six Nations of the Grand River. Uh, I am a registered dietitian for a little bit over 10 years now. Um, I've worked in a number of different First Nation communities. Um, I've worked in different aspects. I'm a Kind of a stay at home mom. I have uh, my children here. I have two young children and a 13, 14 year old just started into high school. So it's, uh, it's been a really fun and exciting time for us. Um, 
I'm happy to share with you today the background and information that I've been able to learn and carry with me um, for probably I would say since I really started studying the last 15, um, 15 or so years uh, into um, Haudenosaunee foods and culture and language and um, the Western type sphere of becoming a registered dietitian and working as a medical health professional as well. So don't mind, my children are here with me. Uh, so you'll hear things like Olaf in the background. So Netogan uh, Yontoko Batni Goloha is uh, a saying that we, when we come together, we actually try to bring our minds together in a way that is cohesive and connecting and safe. Uh, so I think it's a really nice gesture for us to connect in that way. Sorry, I'm just trying to get my slides are good here. There we go. Okay. Uh, so again, so so be it in our minds. One thing that um, as a Haudenosaunee dietitian, it's really important for me to understand um, my clients or my patient and really to meet them where they're at. And I believe that's a teaching in our in uh, my Haudenosaunee culture that just um, looks at the individual as opposed to either you know the disease state or the the condition or you know the problem. Um, so I like this um, space with um, Tik Not Han, and I've come into you know connecting into some of the words that he shares in you know the art of joy and the happiness and the art of communication. And I really, really like his connection here because it, it does underline a lot again in what my understanding as a Haudenosaunee dietitian um, is. So nothing can survive without food. Everything we consume acts either to heal us or to poison us. And we tend to think of nourishment only as what we take in through our mouths but we can consume with our eyes, our ears, our noses, um, you know, through our, our tongues and our bodies, every, all of that stuff is also food. The conversations going on around us and those we participate in are also food. So are we consuming and creating the kind of food that is healthy for us and helps us to grow? And when we say something um, that nourishes us and uplifts the people around us, um, we are feeding love and compassion when we talk like that and use those words. Uh, so when we speak and act in a way that causes tension and anger, we're actually nourishing uh, violence and, and suffering. So I really do appreciate those words because that um, comes into connection with a lot of the, again, the space that I've understood in my put in Haudenosaunee teachings. So food sovereignty, um, this is something, it's a very Western concept. Again, um, putting titles like indigenous food sovereignty, it's something that you kind of have to do to give it that separate space from you know, the, the Western or the Canadian um, or you know, American type population. Um, it gives it its own space, I guess. But again, you have to remember that even the word indigenous itself encompasses you know, it could be different. It, it encompasses, encompasses hundreds of thousands of different foods, seeds, um, you know, and people. So really, it's not um, a one size fits all, but it's it's an approach and a start to identifying that, you know, there, there was a food practice and a food system that existed before colonization took place. So Indigenous food sovereignty is a specific policy approach to addressing the underlying issues impacting Indigenous peoples and our ability to respond to our own needs for healthy, culturally adapted Indigenous foods. The ability to make decisions over the amount and quality of food that we hunt, we fish, we gather, grow, and eat. So I myself am not just a, a practicing dietitian. Um, I also hunt fish grow and gather traditional foods 
as part of my practice. So um, I'm always making sure that I understand uh, really what I'm asking of clients or patients to become a part of or connect to, right? If I don't hunt and understand the limitations, if I don't fish and understand the conditions of the water and the fishing um, cycle, if I don't plant um, corn and beans and squash, I don't understand soil quality. All of those things are um, greatly impacted aspects of um, you know, asking people to participate in a food system. So really I try to build as much knowledge and understanding myself um, so that I can share that and inspire others um, to engage wherever they see themselves fit. And that's how I operate as a, as a registered dietitian. Uh, so as we, I also was able to take part actually in um, a national food study. So it was coast to coast here in Canada and it's called the First Nations Food Nutrition and Environment Study, FNFNES. You can search in Google or wherever you'd like to. Um, but that report is the first of its kind below the 60th parallel. And it has a unique uh, approach that in 2012 was um, very different than most research projects that were done in and with indigenous, indigenous people. Um, so from that report, I participated and helped run as a nutrition research coordinator on the Ontario portion of the report. And we kind of found that, you know, 29% of First Nations um, reported what's noted as food insecurity. So food insecurity, again, is that space that kind of connects into um, us not being able um, to access our traditional foods. So you'll see that again, 33% of the urban Aboriginal households are food insecure as well. So this was from Willows et al. in 2009, and I'm sure the numbers are even higher today. Um, we do know that more than 50% of most of our Indigenous communities are um, living, quote, off reserve. Um, and they, it's just because we don't have enough housing and land base to support the population um, within our communities. Here in Six Nations, we have a population of over 30,000 um, on our membership. And there is basically... In the small area, we have a very large tract of land called the Haldeman Tract um, that was allotted to um, our people uh, many, many years ago. But it's actually, um, you know, a space that has kind of gotten much, much smaller over the years, um, be it through, you know, renting land and different types of agreements and contested um, land, you know, agreements as well and taking land, things like that. You know, they're, they're real things that are happening today, which definitely do Im impacts just the, the ideal of food sovereignty and food security as well. So again, the urban um, population and, and the in on reserve, off reserve type of population, I mean, it's really difficult to categorize because I worked in both of those spaces as well at the Aboriginal Health Centers in Hamilton and Brantford. And it's hard for people that don't have a connection back to their homeland and to the cultural teachings and the knowledge keepers um, to really connect into the food system. So, you know, as we have to continue to live in urban areas, I can only see that that number is going to continue to increase, unfortunately. And that number is again compared 33% in urban spaces compared to 9% for the non Indigenous um, population. To, to be, you know, food, food secure. And that's, that's just not even specifically about Indigenous foods, it's just about access to food in general. So in this food um, and nutrition study, what we did was we took um, a few different areas into um, consideration. We looked at what kind of traditional and market foods that people on reserve were eating. Uh, what contaminants, if any, are in the traditional foods? 
and are the traditional foods safe to eat? Um, we did that through household questionnaires, um, diet questionnaires, health focused questionnaires, and then questionnaires about um, how they harvested food, and then a food security questionnaire as well. And we took traditional food samples um, to, test, to test with Health Canada um, for different contaminants and hair samples to test for um, mercury contamination. And then we check to see, you know, is it safe drinking water? We know that water um, is typically an issue in many First Nation communities across Canada. And, um, you know, we took water sampling to check for different trace meadows. Uh, we did samples from homes um, and taught people how to test their water in their homes as well. And then we did surface water sampling for different pharmaceuticals. Uh, we wanted to know what contaminants, if any, are in the community's water systems. So it's a hugely impactful study when we think about how this ties into, you know, our patient care, into our personal care, into our care and giving and love for our, you know, family members. Um, food is medicine. It is absolutely everything um, to our wealth, you know, to our well-being. And it's really important that we um, can connect into and connect uh, with food and food systems that have been here for thousands of years and that we support those systems. Uh, our traditional um, food systems and our sovereignty space is not just for ourselves. If you can... Um, look back, you're going to, you know, acknowledge that your ancestors, if you're not um, First Nation or, in, you know, Indigenous to these lands, that your ancestors actually were welcomed here and cared for in the same food system that exists today in our communities. You know, in our communities, when COVID hit, we were still able to provide each other with, you know, traditional foods and food ways. And that's not something that was widely accessible to the Canadian population. You know, unfortunately, the food system is um, very reliant on imports um, and, you know, specialty foods and very um, regulated and highly uh, revered specifics. Um, if you kind of think about like Canada's food guide, like those ones are the top ones, right? And when you walk into the, the grocery store during COVID, I mean, the first thing you're seeing is that you don't have any access to um, all of the, you know, the whole section for fish uh, was gone. You know, it was one of the first ones to go. And when I think about that of, you know, the traditional value uh, of, our fish. It's something that we have access to year round. It's not just a one season type deal. Um, we can fish at any time um, of the year. And we um, also have, you know, a high nutritional value in what that provides for us, right? There's very high protein, there's very high um, and, and very healthy and healing fats um, in those fish. And it helps with tissue repair. It helps to, um, you know, increase and impact the immune system. And, and those things were gone. They were non-existent in the Canadian food system. So uh, again, I look at that sovereignty space or even the insecurity space. And I, you know, I do question again to think of who is really food insecure when it comes to that, you know, because it, Canadians weren't allowed to go out and to just, you know, hunt and fish and do what you needed to do, right? That was um, very regulated and highly controlled. And it has been, you know, they do that for their reasoning um, because they control their food system. But we do that um, within our own communities and we do it in a sustainable way that it doesn't have to be overly or heavily regulated. Um, that we collectively, you know, work with each other with a good mind and support each, you know, each other. And, and it's not just people we're supporting, we're supporting the environment and the system and the fish and the water and the, you know, the plants, everything, the air, the earth, we're supporting an entire um, ecosystem along with our, our responsibility in that way. So 
So the food study itself did because it worked with um, different traditional um, communities, it had to represent and um, connect into that type of space. And what we found going into the food study before we started it, some of the nutrients of high concern in some of the First Nations were um, vitamin A, calcium, vitamin D, and then high iron deficiency. And then we had some real diet related concerns with obesity, um, diabetes, heart health, and poor dental health. And those were kind of on the top of the list for what um, many First Nations were having to deal with. So again, when I talked about that, um, the space of bringing our minds together, that becomes, again, it's a, it's a personal responsibility. It's what you bring to the table. It's identifying and carrying your own um, purpose and, and pros into your discussions and into your care and the care that you're offering and giving to others. And breath becomes very important. Um, it is another teaching that along the lines, again, you know, breath control uh, is, I'm also a yoga instructor. I've been doing yoga a little over 15 years and I cannot function without it, without having that um, brain, you know, your mind and body connection in that way where you can control your breathing and place it in different healing areas and parts of your body in that way. That's what's talked about in a lot of our ceremonial practices as Haudenosaunee men and women here in Six Nations, as well as in our creation story. There's, you know, the breath of wind or the, the blowing of the wind and, and that um, the gusts of wind and the purpose of all of that movement, right? Those vibrations that it actually creates and it uplifts us, right? And that's something that um, has been, you know, really important. So I connect that in my dietetic practice with my patients and clients. I connect breath work in a lot of the time um, in dealing with different types, you know, of food ailments, even a lot of things that come into play with, you know, stomach issues, you know, breathing and taking that time to relax and to control your breath. You know, there's a wonderful technique by Andrew Wheel called 478. Um, you could Google that on YouTube, but that's, it's a technique that just teaches you how to take breath in, to hold space for breath, right? Give it its purpose. Um, and then to distribute and pull things from your own body, it gives you a sense of real control. And this is a, a creation that I've um, put together in connecting our language in that way, um, called Ongoya Gato Gato Stroni. Sorry, my son wanting. Sorry. So, um, yeah, strength, strengthening our breathing again. So this is a movement and breath work that I've done in Mohawk. And again, we have what's called the Ganohanyo, which was, it's a address of Thanksgiving and honoring that we do um, daily to just remind ourselves of everything that um, has been shared with us. Um, so that we're able, I don't know if um, you were able to connect into one of the other, um, presentations I did with the summit, but it actually talks more about the Thanksgiving address in it as well. And that's what I'm referring to. So there, there's a lot of breath work and um, space dedicated to that um, in that work as well. Yeah. Oops, I'm not moving. Sorry. Um, so again, this research, like I mentioned, the FNFNES study was um, what we are, um, you know, referring to as participatory research. Uh, before the 19th and during the 1950s, um, a lot of research in First Nations and, you know, Inuit communities was done on our people as opposed with our people. 
Um, and it takes a very different light and a very different um, space when you're not including people that have different cultural understandings, languages, um, and backgrounds than the actual researchers. And, you know, there is that idea to say, oh, well, you know, well, we want to, we want to know what you are. So we can't, we can't engage with you or we won't be able to study you as if, you know, like, <laughs> like, they're like they're very short interruptions going to you know disrupt thousands of years of evolution of a culture right so it, it's just it's bizarre um and i learned that going through you know my western very western education i have a master's degree in cultural and critical studies from mcmaster university and i have a bachelor um honors degree from western um university and i went to the northern ontario school of medicine um, to complete my dietetic internship. So I, I've been around um, a lot of that type of thinking and a lot of those um, types of discussions. Um, so I, I'm really happy even when in 2012 that we've come to the space where, you know, we have to kind of rethink really what limitations that we're working with and that we're dealing with and in, in what we have so far on the books um, or in evidence-based uh, materials because, you um, how accurate are they? If we really want to make a change, and and what I'm trying to underline here again is that you know indigenous foods and culture isn't just for us, and it's nobody else's place or purpose to quote give it back to us or to you know offer that to us in that way. It's to your benefit if you are not an indigenous person to just as your ancestors benefited in the past you know, um, from colonization, from coming and connecting in with, with our ancestors and connecting in with our foods and our cultural ways, they survived here because of that. And that's the type of relationship that needs to continue um, going forward if we are going to collectively continue to share space um, in the land and the water and air that, you know, that we are in today. So Participatory research is a small portion of it. Again, it's something again that helps to um, not necessarily coming to communities with um, research and ideas in hand, but being able to build and um, collectively bring ideas together to support um, nations in the way that they need to be supported, right? Not one is like the other. Um, so you can really miss different opportunities if you try to make you know a, a template that you try to run to all of these other communities and that wasn't necessarily done there was a lot of learning and opportunity in FNFNES that was um, identified so it's definitely a, a better way to go and to create materials so we did have in Ontario we had um almost 1500 adults that participated. And like I said, that's a lot of really good information talking about the backgrounds of, you know, their food, um, their health needs, their health matters. And, you know, what is their understanding of some of the issues around access and um, support for traditional food use today? Oops. So what kinds of traditional market foods do we find people were eating on um, some of the First Nations? So top traditional foods here in Ontario were deer, corn, beans, perch, and walleye. Um, some of the top store-bought foods uh, were different types of canned soups, um, you know, the typical vegetables uh, and fruit, pastas, and cereals. And then we also found that, you know, the traditional foods people were eating um, only really added up to about three teaspoons a day or maybe one and a quarter cups of traditional foods a week. And um, the major concerns that we also found in uh, the communities, of course, were, you know, obesity and diabetes were and heart disease. So those are um, the traditional ones that are, you know, kind of spoken of when we do speak of Indigenous communities. But, you know, it's the health um, setting for, I would say, a lot of the Western population. So it's not just an Indigenous issue. Um, it's a it's a nationwide issue as well. So I think the concerning part from what my dietetic perspective was that we do a lot of work in diabetes um, 
diabetes education in our First Nation communities. And I think it's been ongoing over 10 years now. There's a really heavy hand on it. So I think there needs to be quite a shift in that same participatory space as well, because, you know, having 17% of the people that identified having diabetes not really know whether they had type one or type two, um, that means that there's a lot more work in education and knowledge translation that still needs to be done. So we identified as well some of the barriers um, to actually eating more traditional foods. Uh, there was a lack of time, a lack of knowledge, very difficult to access, government restrictions, um, a lack of a hunter, and then a lot of industry and farming um, that as well as, you know, there's a lot of space around First Nations and um, the reserved land for their use is um, a lot of them have like garbage dumps and things like that or waste treatment and that around them. Um, that's a whole part of a different, you know, space that leads into environmental racism. Um, there was a real reason to connect into that type of, um, you know, that type of space. Um, Nobody really wanted at first to really live <laughs> close to the reserves. So they would put those things up around the reserves that contribute into the quality of the water, which is why we tested the water. So some of the lessons learned is that, you know, presence equals production. Um, technology uh, was really important as well. And, you know, being able to um, share social media and share, you know, things on the computer computer and with iPhones and things like that. And then again, just trial and error. One size does not fit all. Like I said, it um, does not transfer from community to community. You have to really get in and discuss how and what the needs of each nation um, are if you're going to identify some real needs. Because the, the marker of Indigenous does not um, cross the board, right? Like I said, if, you know, some communities have way more knowledge keepers in food and some have way more knowledge keepers in um, ceremony or language. Um, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't transfer to say that just because they're all indigenous, they're all food insecure, right? We have to have more detailed information to really support um, productive work going forward. So again, some of the major disruptions people are talking about now, I am an intergenerational survivor of the mush hole in Brantford. My great great grandmother um, was taken to residential school. Her um, daughter, my grandmother was not taken to residential school only because they had to in essence flee the reserve. So they did not stay in the community so that um, you know, they would have access to the children to take them to the school. They left to go work in farming communities in the surrounding Niagara area um, and kept their children away from their homelands, um, which is a different type of, you know, cultural abuse in its own way. They weren't close to family and friends. So that was um, my experience um, with the residential school system. It had a huge disruption in language. Uh, but I've done my best to kind of bring language and culture back in through um, a lot of study and using that with my um, family members. So again, residential schools have been around for, you know, over 150 years now. Um, they exist today in, you know, in the, the actual system of, you know, child welfare system. So it's a whole different kind of look and turn to it. And the schools are still on reserve are still chronically underfunded. Um, so again, some of the issues that are, you know, the legacy dealt with are, you know, children not given enough clothing or food. Indian residential schools tried to make children talk, dress and think and act like non-Aboriginal um, Canadians. And, you know, just in 1996, the last Indian residential school was closed. And that was the one here in Brantford. So just about 20, 25 minutes from my house. Um, So food experiments, um, we found um, from some, uh, ha just by happen chance, Ian Mosby was kind of a historian just looking into the history of the Canadian food system and came across um, some of these uh, 
experiments that were actually done. Um, you know, the Federal Nutrition Services Division was established in 1941, and it was a, a biochemist and doctor named Lionel Pett. Um, he was a major player in setting nutritional standards and policy in Canada. Um, Pet's mind um, kind of wanted to look at different vitamins and minerals intake and how they affected the body. Um, so the long-term impact of that kind of hunger during childhood leads to, you know, some major issues. And I think that that's the food psychology part that um, is being dealt with today in, um, you know, my practice, that there is a big disconnect between the, the wealth and the support or the you know, need for traditional foods um, in the communities, unfortunately, you know, because of the residential school system, it, it wasn't just we couldn't speak our language, everything in our languages talks about kinship, it talks about our responsibility to the water to the, the plants to the earth, to the soil to the sun to the moon and our language is, is strictly about kinship. And if we're not able to, you know, talk in that way and to have that respect and that um, responsibility ingrained into us, um, you know, we start to forget the importance of all of those different pieces that actually make up who we are as human beings. Um, so that was really one of the most detrimental effects um, of these types of experiments. Again, you know, the residential school itself and then doing specifics on, um, you know, children and what they would eat or wouldn't eat. Um, and again, their language and cultural use being denied to them as well. So, but right off the bat, the traditional foods that they were used to were not being um, grown or respected or accessed by them. Um, you know, when they were working at, you know, the farms at these residential schools, they were planting things that were not traditional foods to them. They were planting market-based foods, things that the, you know, the nuns or, you know, the teachers or school handlers could take to market for, for money and, you know, selling it. It wasn't even for the, the kids to eat, unfortunately. So, you know, there's a lot of um, space that this type of behavior really did ingrain in not only our children, but those adults that inflicted that harm and that, um, you know, type of care in their minds um, to these children. And those are, you know, legacies that are carried. It's not just the, the hurt, the shame and the pain. It's also that, you know, that arrogance that, you um, knowledge base, that type of disdain that the Canadian public is actually carrying as well. So that's what, when we talk about reconciliation, we really need to have those real conversations about that because there are grown-ups that were responsible for doing that to children and they need to be accountable. It's not just about hearing about, um, you know, the, the survivor's voices and the survivor's experiences. The people that actually inflicted this harm on these children need to speak up. They need to share why, how, and what is being done in their mindset, in their way, in a path to reconciliation today. It's detrimentally important to reconciliation to take place. So again, um, in, in the space of being able to provide voices, Indigenous voices into, um, you know, up and coming research and food um, sovereignty, food acknowledgement, food systems. Um, we look at some of the regulations and committees and procedures that are in place today. So CIHR um, has guidelines for research involving Aboriginal people. If you want to work with Indigenous people or First Nations or Inuit, make sure that you look to these sources and that you understand what they're actually asking you to do and that they're a part of your um, research and, you know, project or program um, positions. The Tri Policy, um, Tri Council Policy 9, um, ethical conduct for research involving humans is another important aspect, right? So that we're not causing um, harm 
that we're thinking very clearly and well about our responsibility again. And OCAP principles are, um, if you've never, FN, F, FNIG, First Nation Indigenous Governance, is a space that you can Google again that talks about OCAP. The ownership, control, access, and possession principles are there to help to guide and to support your um, research or your work in a way that really does help you to paint that path of how to work well with um, Indigenous or First Nation communities here um, in, in Canada. Because it's often difficult that if you don't have a friend or a Native person that you know to be able to know where to start. So these organizations have put packages together that can help to inform you first and foremost to give you some principles and some values and some ideas um, to shape your work, but also underlining that you are going to go into this relationship of work with another entity, another nation um, or such, or multiple nations, but you need to give them each their own um, recognition and value. Um, so this was a video, the link isn't popping up right now, but it was just a video, it was a spoken word um, that I did. I could put it in the chat. Um, we can check it out later. So again, traditional food does improve the diet quality because um, mo the traditional foods that we measured in this study actually had higher amounts of zinc in them. Zinc is a, uh, helps to with growth and maintenance of your body. Um, it helps with vision, immune, blood clot clotting, thyroid function, and wound healing. Um, high levels of protein, right? We're talking about fish, deer, elk, moose, um, beans, multiple, you know, 40, 50 different varieties of beans. Um, so those types of foods, again, you know, working on cell growth and maintenance and iron, you know, components of red blood cells that carries oxygen throughout the body. So very important foods. Um, some more nutrients, again, the vitamin D, high levels of vitamin D found in our traditional foods that help absorb calcium, maintain healthy bones and teeth, help your muscles, nerve and immune system work properly, high in vitamin B12 and B6 needed to keep your nerve and blood cells healthy and you know, support proper development of the brain. So a, tr a traditional diet will promote better controls of your blood glucose, your weight, blood pressure, fat levels of, um, in the blood, cholesterol and triglycerides. Because of the types of foods that these animals eat, when you, when you eat a deer, it doesn't have the same um, chemical makeup as, you know, the, the CAFOs or the, the cows that are being fed, you know, corn diets and things like that. So these foods that are eaten by, you know, the fish and the deer, they're natural foods. They're foods that they've been, again, eating for thousands of years and have maintained, you know, their well-being. So these are just some examples of, again, and this is a, it's on the NKIN website. So if you go to Dietitians of Canada and look up the Indigenous Nutrition and Knowledge Information Network, NKIN, um, we have these free calendars on there that can be used that talk about, again, food has more than just a nutritional purpose, you know, even as dietitians that we talk about the emotional, the mental, the spiritual, and the physical um, support that our foods are able to give us in those ways. And that's, it's really a way that if you're looking to bring foods into your diet, or you're looking to recommend traditional foods to your clients that you can help to speak or share additional aspects of that food. It helps to create a relationship with food that goes well beyond um, just its physical, chemical um, proportions connected into your disease state, right? That we, we don't want the book terminology. We want real life. We want connection. We want a relationship to be built here. So that is my time. So thank you very much. Um, there's my contact information if anybody wanted to connect in with me. And thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you, uh, dear Wadro. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your learning with us. Uh, it was very practical, it's uh, informative, and in many ways, uh, inspiring.
uh, to me as I think about uh, my own health. So now we'll enter into some uh, questions. If we have, uh, there's two ways to ask questions. You can put your question in the chat uh, or you can raise your hand and then we can unmute and you can uh, ask your question. So we have those two things available. So while you're thinking, I do have one question. Um, I remember when I was in residential school, I remember the diets we had and was mainly uh, oatmeal and potatoes and, and soup. So I was wondering how, what you think about that kind of uh, food that we got in residential school forming, you know, some of the survival diets that we live on today. Yeah, it's very true. Thank you for sharing that, um, Sharon. And yeah, so the, the residential school here in Brantford is um, widely known by many surviving students as the mush hole because those children were asked to eat mush, you know, oat mush um, three times a day sometimes. That was really a lot, you know, of their diet was just that. Again, when they're out farming these other beautiful nutrient high foods um, that are going to market, they're being fed mush. And again, you have to, you know, there's a real disdain that uh, becomes built in that. Like it is, it becomes a survival food. So it does become something that people you'll connect into, or it becomes a traditional type of food because it's something that nourished you. You know, a food does give us love. It gives us um, warmth. You know, when I think of a lot of those kids were cold, they didn't have sufficient um, clothing or blankets or space to warm them that a bowl of warm, you know, mush is loving in a way. And that food psychology space is really um, what was being built there. And it's built in the same way with our traditional food systems, right? When we're in the garden with our grandmother and she's singing to us and we're holding on to those beautiful leaves or beans and you know we're standing in the soil all of those emotions and things are becoming inside of us a part of who we are and how we perceive food and that is what was taken away so we perceive food as something to be handed to us something to be a reward a gift you have to achieve you have to be good and you will get a little piece you know, because a lot of these kids did see that too, that the, the teachers or the nuns were eating eggs and bacon while those children were eating very bland, very um, bulk type foods as well. So again, they're, they're purchasing in high um, proportions, very cheap, cheap food like potatoes, right? That very cheap and can get a bunch of them just dumped off there and they're going to sit around for quite a while. So there's not going to be a loss there when I think of that in a, you know, the, the food management type of mindset, but yeah, it, it has a huge psychological effect. And, you know, again, that's what I say. We're always looking at what, um, where our clients and our, our patients and our, our communities are at when dealing with these, these uh, issues surrounding food. Oops. Sounds like somebody fell down. Thank you for that. That's something that I always wondered. Uh, we do have a question here in the chat room. Um, what are opportunities for non-Indigenous people in Canada to support greater growth and access to traditional foods and food systems? So that's a great question. I think it depends on providing support in First Nations first and foremost, because like I said, again, you know, the food system is alive and well in our traditional communities. It, our people carry the responsibility to those foods in the cultural identity, in our language, in our songs, in our ceremonies. So it's important that we direct our care, um, our knowledge translation, our support um, from the outside, from medical professionals, from um, food systems outside the reserve, like uh, grocery stores, those types of things that we direct that knowledge and that um, connection inward first and build that system, continue to build that system up within the communities, within the First Nations. 
And then um, once that has gained a lot of support, because you have to think again that the system itself was meant to be torn down. That's why children were taken away so that they couldn't build that system from within in the communities. So if we don't go back to the communities and help to restructure and rebuild that system with them, we don't have that anymore, you know? And there goes the language, there goes the culture, there goes the ceremonies. And you can't leave and come back and connect into when you need to regenerate or revibrate or offer yourself to your community. You won't have any place to do that if we don't think about it in that way. So I would say in any of your work, if you could start there on a personal level, I would say start with a food start with one food. When I talked about corn, um, I'll just, I'll show you this quickly. So when I talked about corn, there are over 40 different, you know, varieties of corn. This is a type of corn that we grow here in Six Nations. I just picked this yesterday from my garden. Um, there's also, you know, Flint corn. So this is like, um, we would use these for different things. And this is what I say is a as a dietitian, like there's such different nutritional qualities in all of these foods. Like you're not going to see this in the grocery store, right? But we have access to this. This is the type of corn that grows in our community that we make bread out of. Um, we make porridge like that type of, but it's high nutritional value. We mix these kernels with um, a wood ash that actually lies it and adds calcium into it. Traditionally, that's how our people prepare this food. So we have a high nutrient source. It's not that, that bland um, type of food that was given to us, that lower quality nutrient food. These are our traditional foods and they're, they're much, much higher um, in that quality. So I would say start there, maybe start with just one type of food um, and grow from there. See how many different ways that you can cook that food how you can care for that food, how many songs you can sing to that food, how many ceremonies can you have for that food? Because it can be overwhelming. I know some people like want to change everything, change everything all at once. Well, that's not sustainable. We have to, again, think about the ecosystem as well. Like if we all tried to eat traditional foods right now, it would be a huge strain on the entire system because it's a lot, it's a lot of people. That's why the Canadian government regulates the Canadian people's um, use in hunting and fishing um, for that purpose. But I mean, in, in our communities, again, like I said, just build into the communities, connect into the communities, support that. And then again, being able to, you know, add one food is, is key. Thank you. Thank you, uh, dear Weedro. That was excellent. Um, here's another question. It says, um, let me see. Um, do you have any advice for, uh, just wait. first of all, it says, thank you for a fascinating presentation. Uh, for those of us looking to build relationships with Indigenous people and Indigenous communities near us to discuss their needs and, and potential research or support for health advocacy, do you have any advice to help us get started in the most positive way? So yeah, again, building relationships is key. So uh, there's a lot of self-reflective space and personal responsibility that has to be um, connected into first. You have to be genuine in what you're doing and why you want to engage. It's really, really important. So first and foremost, like I said, nobody wants somebody singing across from them and say, how can I help you? Think about if you want to enter into a partnership or date somebody. Is that who you want to sit across and say, well, how can I help you? Let me fix you. Can I come here and do, what can I do for you? You know what I mean? Nobody wants that. You have to carry your own personal identity and responsibility for yourself. What you're able to bring to the table, you have to easily and quickly identify those to be to support another um, community or person or program or proposal in a sense. So I say start there. Self-reflection is key. Um, and then again, Moving forward, then you're just going to work on your communication skills and how you engage um, and meet needs of each other. 
Thank you. There's one more question here, and it's uh, similar, but it involves the patient groups. Um, first of all, uh, they thank you for inf insightful presentation, and they appreciate the point about how traditional research is done to communities rather than with communities. So how can non-Indigenous people in Canada support more part participatory research with diverse communities, including in our own work as patient groups? So as patient groups, how can we do that? As, sorry, I missed that one. As patient groups, how can you work into research? Yeah, like because we're where we work with patient groups and a lot of the people uh, involved in this summit are part of patient groups across Canada. So right. how can non-Indigenous people in Canada support more part participatory research with diverse communities, including our own work as patient groups? Right. So I would look at um, so where you're getting your um, you know, where you have to kind of run your patient groups out of and your support systems around your patient group. So make sure that let's say um, if you're working in a hospital or a hospice or a long-term care facility, that those organizations have um, high standards on cultural competency, that they're doing their best and um, full effort to um, educate and make aware and create safe space for um, cultural learnings and understandings around Indigenous people, that they understand the impact of the past and how it affects the present. Um, because patients are, patients are in control to a point, you know? And, but the, the scary thing is, is that being um, First Nation and Indigenous patients in the Canadian healthcare system system today can actually cause you your life you know self-identifying as indigenous in a system that has not you know traditionally recognized the value set of indigenous people or their indigenous medicines their food as medicine for their health and well-being as well has always been of high um, concern and you know people do practice these things in our communities um, but it's not welcomed in practice when we get into the hospital or service systems. And that's high concern. So we want to make sure that the system itself is structurally sound. And by having leadership at the top, the CEOs, the directors, um, the managers, um, taking cultural competency, there's a training called Sanyas training that can be offered um, to help, again, to identify First Nations and Inuit and Métis uh, issues um, in past and how they affect the present. It helps move, they have a portion of their training that talks about, um, you know, from bystander to ally, which is wonderful in that movement of how do you take all these knowledge pieces that you have gained in Indigenous um, spaces and how do you put them into practice in your work? Um, so that's something that I would look to to advocate for that, that you can't make all the moves yourself. Um, it helps to support patients immensely if the system that their care workers are working under actually understand um, fully that that type of um, Indigenous identity typed service. If I say I'm First Nation, if I say I'm Haudenosaunee, what kind of care are you going to give to me? Is it detrimental to my health or not, right? We don't know about that today. So I would, again, advocate at those higher levels for cultural safety, cultural awareness and knowledge translation, um, and that it goes across the board that every single, every single um, person has to take that type of training because I think it, it can help to support the discussions with patient and patient care teams. Um, in, in, you know, individual health practice as well as whole. Excellent, thank you once again, Terry. We've run out of time, so thank you so much. Your uh, presentation was very informative and very inspiring, so we, we thank you all. And then for everyone else, uh, please ensure that you fill out the evaluation once the link is sent to you. 
And yeah, so well, I guess we have to close here. So uh, thank you very much, Terry. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Una. Bye-bye.